Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this important panel. I'm going to read the title to you. Social Sustainability, How Can Film Schools Become More Diverse and Accessible in a Sustainable Way? We are very, very happy as Film School Fest Munich to have this panel and to welcome all of you here. Dee from London, Jakob from Copenhagen, Fatih from Berlin, and then of course Aida, our moderator from Hamburg. Um, this is a topic that is very dear to our heart and we are also currently organizing an entire conference on this topic, which will be happening from November 28th to the 30th at the Evangelische Akademie Tutzing. And this is a little bit of our prologue to the entire conference and our international approach to the topic, because we want to focus on talent, on young filmmakers and on film schools and what they are doing in this field. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Aida, for hosting this panel for us. Uh, am I on? Thank you. <laughs> From my point of view, it sounds the same. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for all the organizers of the Film Fest who have been uh, taking amazing care of us. My name is Aida Begovic. I'm a sociologist and I've been working in diversity consulting in the arts and culture sector for about seven years, uh, focusing on issues of racism and classism. Uh, also writing on these issues and I'm very happy I get to moderate this interesting panel today and also that I get uh, got to be included in the jury of this film fest. I will uh, start with my colleagues joining me from my left, your right. We have uh, Fatih Abai. Uh, Fatih Abai is the Diversity and Inclusion Officer of the European Film Academy. Fatih uh, trained as a cultural anthropologist and uh, his focus was on migration, diversity, racism, gender, critical theory and post-colonial studies. Before joining the European Film Academy, he worked for an anti-racism NGO in Germany with a focus on political advocacy. And this event was actually created in cooperation with the European Film Academy. Uh, which is known for awarding the European Film Award and representing European film and its industries. Thank you for joining us. And uh, to my other side, we have Di Karai. Di has a wide range of industry experience. Uh, of forging EDI best practice and creating authentic editorial storytelling having worked in productions within Sky, Warner Brothers, and uh, now with the London Film School as Senior Culture and EDI Manager. Their directed approach has developed and been integral to changing industry attitudes, culture, and practice. They specialize in making the uncomfortable comfortable. Thank you for joining us, Dee. And now we have Jakob Högel, who is going to have to help me with introduction, <laughs> because the, some of those <laughs> are on my other notes. But Jakob, uh, you are the head of education and research at the National Film School in Denmark, and maybe you could tell us a little more, a bit more about that. Sure. Uh, just recently started at the film school. My background is in visual anthropology and uh, being in the film industry as a producer, uh, but also as a film commissioner. So also financing and head of a talent scheme at the Danish Film Institute. And Jakob has joined us yesterday from Madrid with a very long train ride. So thank you for making the trip. Thank God you can sleep on trains. Otherwise, I wouldn't <laughs> be awake now. <laughs> Um, when we were sitting in the lounge just before this talk, we realized that we're all fairly new in the positions that we're working in right now. And Dee, you said something very interesting. You said when you joined the film school, in a way, you ripped it apart. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. So one, thank you for having me. It's um, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, when I joined the film school, it was an interesting dynamic because I heard a lot of 
gossip, I think is probably fair to say, you know, of how things were and how they uh, weren't doing. So what I decided to do when I joined the school within the first three months is I did a full audit uh, of people's experiences, students' experiences, staffing, uh, what do policies look like, what does progression look like, um, and also the kind of data that they collect, which was very, very minimal. Uh, and as we're constricted because of HESA, which is the Higher Education Board in the UK, they only collect very generic information, and I quite like specific data because I think it's easier to kind of track and manage. And whilst I was there during the three months, I did a lot of what I call trauma listening. Uh, and so that means meeting up with individuals and kind of helping them process what their experiences have been like within the school and the organization. And so what I did is I collected all of that information and then shared it back with the school. It was a very uncomfortable situation for a lot of people because obviously I didn't name anybody, but I kind of said X, Y, and Z happened or is still happening, how do we start to rectify that? And then what I did is I introduced 10 expected behaviors from all staff members and all students. And I made a very harsh rule of going, anybody who stands outside of these behaviors, we will start going into formal processes so that there are consequences and accountability that are always involved in kind of people who are particularly marginalized or um, don't feel that they're being seen or acknowledged. And that's kind of continued on as I've kind of been there. It's been a real whirlwind and it's, I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's been very uncomfortable, which is something that I probably take too much pleasure in um, because I had to almost condition myself to realize the work that I want to do, it's not easy. So if I'm not able to kind of embrace that uncomfortableness, I don't feel like I can be effective. And so whilst I've been doing that, you know, I've, I've cried, I've broken down, um, I've upped my therapy sessions to make sure that I can look after myself as well as looking after my students and staff. And we've seen such a big cultural change within the year that I've been there because people are now starting to feel validated and acknowledged and they know that we've got a long way to go, but they're finally starting to see things that are shifting, um, particularly when there were issues around staffing and their kind of behaviours they weren't being picked up and or they weren't being accountable. And since I've come in, I've ensured that anything that comes across my computer or my desk, I will address it and I will deal with it. So I think this is an issue in a lot of uh, schools, not only film schools, that uh, staff and especially students are experiencing discrimination um, by, uh, by teachers and... Uh, And in some cases also reporting. So it's definitely happening. And in some cases it is also being reported. But there is a lack of accountability. So it just keeps repeating and repeating in every semester with new people. What does accountability look like? Um, so I look a lot of particularly at policies, which is not fun work. But I make sure that I read every single policy that the school has. And I look at where I believe it's not fair to people from lower demographics. So does it speak to people of color? Does it speak to the LGBT community? Does it is it fair to people who are neurodiverse or have a disability? So therefore, you know, one of the issues that we have in our school is accessibility. You know, we don't have lifts. And I think that's horrendous to have as a school where we can't allow people who need wheelchair access in. So that's something that I've kind of been working on and creating solutions on. But the accountability is never easy because it means that people need to put a mirror up to themselves. And I include myself in that. I wish I knew everything, uh, but I don't. So I will make mistakes, but I'm willing to try. Um, okay, I, can I, I, let me give you a concrete example. For example, what if we have a professor that uh, knowingly ignores students' pronouns? So misgenders students and is actually being called out on it by students, but just uh, continues doing that. So what I've done at the school is I've built it into the policy. Um, you know, one of the big factors that I always say is you don't have to agree and you don't necessarily have to like it. However, what we're trying to do is create an inclusive, respectful situation. So what I say with a lot of my staff members is kind of going, if I was to call you, if their name's Andrew, for example, I, I'll, say, I'll call you Bob. Do you like it? And they're like, no. I don't like that because my name's, and I say the same principle lies for pronouns. And if they continuously do it and I get reports for it, they will be put into disciplinaries and then they will be made accountable for it. Whereas I think before my arrival, they, they weren't. Can I ask what policy has this been like um, included in? So I, I created uh, my own policy in terms of diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And it talked, we talked about kind of code of conduct and respectable behaviors. So I went through the school's code of conduct, which was very thorough, but again, there was no consequence or action to it. So what I did is kind of going, once it's reported and it's on my desk, then I'll make sure that I will take it to the right level. I will work with the HR systems. I will work with the 
then CEO to kind of go, this is a repeat of offense. Now we need to escalate it to a formal process. And I've built that in within the school's structure of kind of going, if it continuously happens, there's no um, informal process. It goes straight to formal because I think it's disrespectful to not feel seen or acknowledged when you're not asking for a lot of difference. You're just asking to be seen and um, made to feel aware, you know, and I think we all kind of eager and want that. And to outrightly go against that because you don't believe in it, it feels like for me that doesn't work within the school's values. And I think when we're going against those values of what we're trying to do as a school, then there needs to be that accountability towards it. And I mean, the the subject we're focusing on today is also diversity and sustainability. And I think this can be a good example where, of course, a school will say our values are focused on diversity and we will not accept any kind of discrimination. But uh, this is where it becomes sustainable to like not just have those values on a website, maybe, but also bring it deeper into the system and into the lived realities of the people in the school. Uh, Jakob, maybe you can share a little bit of how um, how values are handled uh, within your school. Yeah, I would say I don't think we are nearly where the UK is in terms of values. There's still a longer discussion going back and forth in, in terms of sh is diversity even a thing we should uh, be concerned with? But more specifically at our school, I think uh, when I started uh, half a year ago, we, I mean, we felt that there was an issue with uh, diversity. And I think the place where schools have the most power is in terms of admission. Uh, we see ourselves as an elite school. We only take in every second year very few students, but they become the main part of the industry. So we have that responsibility to see where should the industry uh, go from here. And uh, we didn't have time to make enormous changes. I think we should do that in the future, but we've made two major changes in the admission uh, this year, or three actually. One was, apart from the normal criteria about talent that you could probably find anywhere, we put a fourth criteria called uh, curiosity about uh, your own society. Mm. That changed a lot uh, and uh, because there's a tendency you fix on ideals of who is an artist. And this is maybe a bit too crude said, but there's a particular male, sometimes in excess type, who seems like a real artist and, and the whole dogma way of Denmark was part of that, uh, whereas the curious factor, if you actually uh, start looking for that with uh, the, the applicants, something happens. So that's one thing. Another thing is that you all, always want mo motivation, but people from high resource background, they can easily sit and say, my artistic ambition is blah, 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 blah. People who are not from that kind of background, they don't speak like that. They cannot even answer that question. But if you do tests, as we do, three full days on the ground, and you ask them, so what are you doing now, and could you have done that differently? They can easily answer, and you can have a real discussion of who has talent. Uh, so that was the second thing we did. How is it we're talking about things inside the admission process? And then the third thing we did was uh, we found out from statistics that quite a lot of people are considering whether they should even apply for the school. A lot, there's a huge group of people just, ah, should I do it, should I not? And of course, for many is a question, am I good enough and so on. Quite a lot of that is, am I right for the school? Will the school actually accept me for who I am? Uh, and in order to counter that, we, and should I show that, we made a, some videos. Yes, please. Uh, and, and we did some uh, questionnaires and realized that actually a lot of people ended up applying where they were considering not applying. It's a very simple tool, but it actually worked. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for showing the film. And where can the film be seen? Is it like on the website of the school or? Uh, it is on the website now, but we did, I'm not the expert on this, but it actually went out to a lot of technical schools, mm. a lot of, uh, in, in social media it was visible. And I think, uh, Yeah, 38% said that that video, oh, it, it's a series of videos with different uh, diversity issues mm -hmm. uh, dealt with. 
that it was a, a huge reason for them applying. I mean, it, it seems so stupid that 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 should be a barrier for people who have actually made films of three, four, five years, and they're still considering uh, whether to apply or not. Uh, so we have to do way more of that. I think we, we also spoke about this, the kind of outreach, whether the schools should not be these kind of, in our case, national institutions located in Copenhagen, where people think it's a castle, can I even get up uh, the tower? We should be felt in the community in, 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 in various parts of the country. And I think we've had great luck with this in terms of gender and uh, uh, ethnic diversity. I think our real challenge is socioeconomic and regional diversity. I think that has still not, uh, we have to do much more work on that. Yeah, you gave us an interesting keyword when you said you consider, the school considers itself an excellent Uh, school, so there's also this criteria, so this exclusivity, so it's actually meant to be exclusive mm. in a way, and also these criteria of what is uh, what is excellent. You also said when when dealing with candidates, what is considered a good filmmaker, what is considered a uh, good film, and so on. So it sounds like there's also a bit of a changing thought process on that. Is that correct? Very much so, uh, and I think we have to take on the responsibility. I know it's different in Germany, you have six and many other schools. In Denmark, it's one school, the national film school. That's That just creates a lot of responsibility for what we're doing. Uh, and I think we have to take on the, the elite idea. We take 48 people in. It, it, we cannot avoid that elitism, but why not include diversity uh, considerations as part of an elite thinking is instead of thinking we're powerless it's for somebody else to do that uh, we should only look at talent in a very abstract way um, yeah so and so this is about you were talking about the students questioning whether they would uh, fit with the school or go well with the school but also especially when it comes to like the socioeconomic background i think there are a lot of students who don't even have this deliberation or don't have this questioning, but who never take into consideration the possibility of going um, into film. So I think that might also factor into that, which is why it's interesting to me that apparently you did such a widespread outreach where it could also... Reach. Yeah, I think we have some real issues. Uh, the, in, in the Danish Film School, people come in on average at age 26, which means that you have probably been working for five, six, eight years making films mm. uh, for free. And of course, in that, there's a huge uh, social uh, discrimination. Uh, people who have parents who can, uh, they can finance this. Uh, and, and I don't know exactly how we're going to tackle this uh, because otherwise the film school is free. The, the, it doesn't cost to uh, to to uh, what do you call it, to apply for the school mm. and so on, but the period before that is crucial. Yeah, and to be 26 and able to go to school instead of work, yeah, uh, full time or something like that. Yeah. Many young people would maybe be forced by their families to do something else. The family says, "This is, I mean, it's not a way of life uh, to to make films." And it is at the end of this, but but how do you feed yourself for, for a number of years? So I think we have to also look at uh, our requirements in terms of how many films you made and, and so mm. on and, and lower that age. Again, like this idea of excellence and yeah. what it means and who, exactly. can, who is allowed to participate in this idea of excellence. In the beginning, you alluded and said, uh, maybe we're not as far as you guys are in the UK. So this is something which I'm very thankful uh, to the organizers of the film festival to bring us uh, together and have this opportunity to see some things that have already come into reality, like your program in, in other places. Uh, Fatih, maybe can you give us some kind of image looking from our position here in Germany? Where are we <laughs> within the European film schools? I think in general, I would like to also kind of scale, look or more from the pan-European point of view. I mean, obviously, we as a European Film Academy, we are also very interested in data and we see a lot of 
uh, initiatives in various countries, also here in Germany, where actually data collection is done. Um, but it's mostly about who is represented. And it would be maybe also interesting, actually, like coming actually to the example what Jakob also did, um, uh, gave is basically... Um, who is not represented and why, like to find out really the real reasons why, for example, certain people from marginalized communities or positions are not applying to schools or why it's not only about family and socioeconomic. I feel there's something else more and this is mostly about what is also already funded and kind of produced uh, uh, in the film industries, I mean, even if you look on the British film, I mean, you did a lot of the BFI, you know, we also did now some diversity inclusion standards and we are developing also our policies. And mostly we took also the UK as an example. But if I look also on the British film, which is still funded today, it's still like representing one group of people and not really everybody and especially the marginalized. And if basically these examples are not kind of established from the peripheral to the center or for the, from the marginalized to the mainstream, so to say, uh, then I feel like there's also this lack of motivation to, for people to apply. So that's why I think it's important also to kind of uh, bridge the gap with uh, funding institutes. Um, and I think the film schools have a big power in that because they have the context, they have the networks, and in order also to kind of guide the graduate students, not only until the festival where they maybe show the films under the umbrella, under the protection of the school, but also kind of guide them to the uh, respective producers or decision makers in order to kind of uh, also basically bring them more into the industry. I was just going to say on that, I think you're right in the sense it's a lot about systemic mindset and I think that plays a key factor. You know, we were speaking earlier and I've been very fortunate to work in industry for around 15 years now. I know I look very young, thank you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when I started working in production, everybody either assumed that I was a runner, which I wasn't. I was one of the head editorial people there or I... Um, was finance or the IT person. Uh, and even with my own family, you know, that's not to say it's the people I worked with, they always kind of go, oh, you know, I, I work in TV. And they'd be like, oh, are you, are you an engineer? And I was like, oh God, no, you know, I, I work with content, I work with production and that's what I love doing. And it was that that kind of really shifted a lot for people because they, we don't think about that representation and how much of a difference it makes. And, you know, you're making the, uh, the films, Jakob, like if there was ever a, a, an Asian British person on TV, whether the show was good or not, I would watch it. Just because it was so nice to see someone who looked a bit like me or the people I know formed out in the, t in, you know, in the TV world or in the film world. And it was, that's what really made a difference for me because it was kind of going, now I can be that person for other people. And it is about having that representation in there and it's not easy and it's very difficult but it is very key to making people very aware of going, this is also an opportunity for you. You don't have to be um, constructed to what your parents might believe or what society might believe. There are options out there that will feed your creative energy. Yeah, and also having like an, an envir environment that will support that because a lot of the times, of course, people do come into situations that are discriminatory, that are hurtful, and then you can have all the motivation and creativity you want in the beginning. It's just a destructive um, environment. And this is, again, where it's so interesting, like what, what that not just diversity in sense of values, but of what we can do and change to really have an impact on uh, people's lives, allowing them to do this work. And um, yeah, I would like to talk a bit about what it is that creates this impact, because oftentimes we have this contrast and divide where diversity actually becomes like a subject of frustration, where we only have it on this theoretical value level and you have this experience where of, of being disappointed or of of even having interest in the subject yourself for whatever reason and um, even uh, if an event like today thank you for your trust for coming and that feeling like oh another panel talk on diversity <laughs> like I wonder if this is worth 90 minutes <laughs> of my life 
um, and yeah, kind of like eroding trust. There was when we're talking about numbers, there was a very interesting uh, survey done uh, with uh, Concordia University in in Canada. And they did a survey amongst uh, staff and students, and especially with students, the majority of students stated that the university is um, making, has efforts in terms of diversity and uh, anti-discrimination, but less than one third of the students uh, thought that those were, that it was a strong commitment. And among the students who said that they had uh, lived uh, or experienced discrimination in the school, uh, uh, it was more than 50% who said they did not believe it was a real commitment uh, to diversity and inclusion. Of course, that makes a disconnect. Uh, at that point, you can talk about diversity as much as you want. If the trust uh, is gone, it's very uh, difficult. So I think um, what are some ways to create real impact to reg regain uh, trust again? I mean, I, I definitely look at every situation in terms of power and kind of advocates. I think I've been quite fortunate, particularly at the London Film School, where I have a, or had a CEO who's now left, but I have a new CEO who's also kind of encouraging and allows me to do the room and it gives me the room to do what I need to do. And I think diversity is a very, it's been, an, it's been a topic that's been going on for almost at least 20 years. You know, people think it's a new fad, it's kind of super woke. And you know, you know these are things that just kind of make me kind of go, I don't, I don't understand why, but I, have learned that that's a lot of that comes from defense you know people want it, not wanting to release the power that they currently have you know we talked about you know i'm very outspoken uh, and it's got me into trouble quite a lot but i think if i don't do that i can't see the change happening so for example at the london film school we have a thing called crits so the students show their films we get um professionals and directors producers etc and they then give critiques where they're not allowed to respond back and one of the films that i was attendance to was around an LGBT relationship. And there was one particular line in it that for me was extremely impactful. But our critique basically said, I don't think that line is valid. I don't think it should have been in the, in the film. I don't see what was the point of it. And I, one, that's not critique, that's opinion. So that needs to be also very clear. But I, I had to stand up because I was in the room and I just went, I don't think that that's acceptable. Whether you understand it or not, you shouldn't completely go, well, that shouldn't exist because you don't understand it. For me as a queer person, I fully resonated with that, with that one line. It really sung home to me. And I really felt that that was something that I, in my heart and in my soul, I understood. So I understood what the, the filmmaker was trying to do, but no one had ever actually spoken up before you know no one had ever actually kind of gone oh should you really be giving critiques like that um and so again I went okay fine if this is how we, I built a complete structure of what does good criticism look like how does that interact with each other because I think in order to cause in order to create impact you just have to challenge and yes sometimes we will get things wrong but we need to use that as a learning opportunity to kind of make it better the issues that I found around device, diversity inclusion is it's the risk factor. It either has to be extremely great and fantastic or therefore it can't be anything else. Like any kind of process in any organization, it's trial and error. You know, we have to try to make things better. We don't have to stick to what we know, especially in this day and age. We've evolved so much in terms of mindset and beliefs. But we have to show, particularly for me, I have to show my students going, you have a voice. Let me support your voice. And I think the more that we can do that, the more change that we'll see come into effect. Um, you were speaking about trial and error, and everybody is after these best practice. Uh, maybe we should share the worst practice as well to like norm normal normalize this trial and error process and taking accountability, like proudly on your website. Here's the way we fucked up this year. <laughs> like um, absolutely. So, but but uh, could you share some best practice from your school? Some things that have created this uh, this this impact, where you're like, okay, I don't only need to read it on the website. I can feel something actually changed. Um, so I, I I do a lot of one to one work, particularly with my staff and students. I'm, I am only one person in the school who does this, but best practice is always a difficult thing because I think that can be interpreted in different ways. So what's best practice to me is probably not going to be the best practice for my my staff. You mm. know, they they want to just get the film made. They want to make sure everything is done. Their um, their journals are completely up to date. They're going to pass. That's their mindset of 
um, whereas for me, best practice is kind of going, are you being open? You know, if you're being challenged by your student, and again, it comes down to that power structure. As a staff member, I have to be open to my students as well as my other tutors and lecturers. They need to be open to their students. Not this is right or wrong. It's of, okay, I'm not sure I understand it. How do we open up that conversation? For me, that's what good practice is. Kind of not allowing things to be as black and white as we try to make them be. Because that's part of the systemic structure. It has to be a certain way. Otherwise, it's not seen as good enough. Uh, and best practice for me is kind of going, it can be this way, it can be that way. I might not understand it, but is it a good film? You know, or do the people that are in the, within the content feel reflected within society? You know, and I think, you know, we can go down the road of cliches and stereotypes, which can be extremely damaging, but they also have a use too, because that's how a lot of people have broken into industry, is kind of really pushing that stereotype of kind of going, well, this is what I believe X, Y, and Z are within that community now we are in a point like i said we've moved on a lot going we don't have to stick to that we can be a lot more open um you know as an asian person i get <laughs> i get called um i get called a very derogatory term because people don't think i'm asian enough mm. you know i don't know uh, i know my language fluently i don't know how to read and write it but then there's other sides of kind of going wow you're really weird and out there and and i'm like well why can't i be both you know, that's, that is what society should be. Um, and everyone feels that I have to be defined in a straight way, which is why I love the uncomfortableness of it all. I think that uncomfortableness is what helps us break through it because we need to be uncomfortable. It's not a nice process. The question for me is what happens with this uncomfortableness? Uncomf can uncomfortableness? You uncomfortableness. <laughs> <laughs> what you said. <laughs> and... Um, an issue that I've encountered in, in universities and schools, not only in film schools, is when I come in as a consultant and I make an analysis and I start making uh, suggestions and so on, is a uh, and, and change that always blocks. Every person has experienced that within themselves. If a change is happening, you can run into blocks. And one block that I'm very surprised by is um, professors feeling uncomfortable that I'm talking to a director, for example, and I say, oh, we have to change this or that. And that the answer is we have professors that have been here for a very long time and they feel uncomfortable with that and they feel offended by that. They feel attacked by that. And then the discussion is done. All this analysis and everything else doesn't matter because of these uh, personal feelings. And I've I've and I found it to be a real block that the discussion really ends there. So I would really uh, like to hear what your experience on this is because there the uncomfortable is there, but it stops. So now the there's an uncomfortable feeling, but it just stops uh, any change from happening. So my question would be like, uh, how do you have experience with that, and maybe also some ideas on on how to blast through this block, preferably. Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, it, I, I have seen that happen in, in a few cases. Uh, and right now at the school, uh, the school is very torn on, on the uh, Gaza-Israel situation. And of course, one reaction is to kind of close down and say, uh, we are here for the arts, as if the arts weren't about <laughs> the rest of the world. Uh, uh, so let's keep that out. So it it is about keep uh, staying with the trouble, as someone would say. How how if we cannot do that within ideal institutions, how would it ever be possible outside ideal institutions? Um, and I think I mean uh, so people close down on certain discussions, uh, and that's they draw the artistic freedom card uh, at certain times and not at others. There are other discussions they love. So it's about bringing in, uh, aren't you open to the, all these other discussions? Yes, I am, but this one just doesn't seem artistic to me for some reason. Then trying to show that there's not any real difference between those two discussions. Does it make sense? Uh, that That we should have that openness to, to all kinds of discussions because that is what will fuel the art. And I think one thing I have learned is that with people who have uh, difficulties with the diversity discussion and when it becomes very kind of tagged on single persons, which I can kind of understand, I think it's important to, to open it up saying this is not about 
uh, statistics of people, or at least that's not the main goal of this. The main goal of this is that we will have a flourishing film culture where films are about many subjects, where you don't have to make a film about uh, Pakistan because you have a Pakistani background or things like that. It's about uh, also asserting film uh, cinema as a, a strong cultural influence. That I haven't met a person who didn't understand that argument. And then it's a question of how how far do you want to go towards the single person? That's where the issues uh, start arising. Yeah, I think um, because I'm very um, in contact with a lot of diversity trainers, uh, also for the industry, but also on the topic on diversity inclusion. And uh, I see it also with institutions, uh, but also uh, in our institution as well. I mean, is uh, is it just my colleagues, you know, uh, or even our board? I mean, you have also then this kind of uncomfortableness or even like uh, also in the industry, you can really see, oh, I feel controlled, right? So uh, I feel dictated. And I feel like especially these diversity trainings, they always go in a very pedagogical way again to teach them. And uh, I feel then there's this blocking, what you just uh, mentioned. And I feel uh, especially um, in our institution, I mean, I'm developing now also like how we can communicate and talk about diversity inclusion in a terminology which is still like understandable to everybody. Obviously, we work in English, and but if I talk, if I use even in the race ethnicity context certain words, I cannot use it in certain countries. So because they are translating it, it will be because diversity inclusion, even if it's a global topic, I feel especially in the European film landscape it's very localized so even if it's taken global but it's very localized so everybody is still translating it into its domestic understanding and if i take the word race for example in germany or in france there's no further discussion so you have to find also ways how to communicate about this and um, to maybe also develop a certain tools in order to also talk with people obviously people who are marginalized talk mostly about their experience their emotionalness but i think it's also interesting to understand why somebody who is in a main position coming from a mainstream position thinks like this i mean this person would not deny that this person is diverse uh, isn't diverse so this person would say i'm diverse anyway but to understand also maybe how with how this person is kind of was confronted. So uh, a lot of trainings lately I look on is also more, it takes more time for sure, but it's more the autobiographic kind of narrative where also certain narratives can be then changed again, but just to understand also more this autobiographic experiences of diversity. Okay, so we have understanding. But do you, what do you say? What do we do in those cases where uncomfortableness and power come together? where someone goes, I'm uncomfortable and I have the power to shut this down? I mean, I think I don't take a very um, kind approach to these things. I think if I'm being bluntly honest, I because diversity is always an interesting topic, but diversity is all of us. You know, there is no one that isn't included in that subject. When people kind of go, oh, you know, you need more diverse films, I kind of go, what does that mean? You know, and I think particularly when we're talking about majority populations uh, in the UK, I can kind of speak of kind of having a majority white male in our industry. I, I still include them, you know, that you are still part of the diversity makeup. That is absolutely vitally important. But I think it then comes down to values and what is our organizational mindsets, particularly when it comes to those power and, uh, and kind of balance elements, because I think I always want to work with people to make it better. Now, if you don't want to work with me, that's a different conversation that we need to have because I think I want you to be better at what you're doing. I also want to be better at what I'm doing. So it's gonna, we have to kind of ride the uncomfortability in order to break through it. And I think when we put those kind of values and consequence in the line, that's when people either start to shift or they don't shift because I think when we look at majority mindset, it's always played in their favor. So they have the power to shut it down. What power do then do the students have? And I think that's something that needs to be thought about a lot more because I now do assessments in terms of going, how open are these conversations? You know, how much are you willing to be challenged? Um, 
I can I can give you a very strange example is before I started at the school they did an announcement for me and did a little bio and I go by the pronouns he him and they and them but they decided to go just they them and I said that's fine I have no problem with that uh before my first day there was a two-page complaint about me before I'd even started in the school uh and it was talking about going we think that they have a personal agenda to come in make everything gender neutral etc and you know bless my CEO at the time he was he was very upset and I said I'm fine and he was like well how can you be and I kind of go because this is what I expect but what I'm telling you is this is how we approach it now you as the CEO what do you want to do about this because you have the power you have the responsibility and you will set that standard of what is okay and what is not and is this really what you want the London Film School to represent and he was like, obviously, no, this is not what I want. So we worked together. We wrote a very good response. Um, you know, they, they were kind of saying that they were going to do a coup if I continued in the role. And I was like, wow, I've not even been here a day. And you already want me out because of my pronouns. And that mindset is kind of going, I'm still willing to work with you. But if you're not, then again, there needs to be a consequence of accountability. Because I'm, I'm grown. I've worked in history for a long time. I've dealt with a lot. But these students are here, they're fresh, they're excited. And if we're not empowering them to be themselves, then we have a duty of care to those people. You know, we have a duty to make sure that they are feeling empowered and seen. And that's why I think I take a lot more of a harsher approach because I'm willing to work with people. But if you're not, then I will build a system that makes you accountable for it. Okay, so also changing um, the, the criteria in this case, for example, for staff or for teachers, not just for excellence in, in film and so on, but also what does it mean to be, uh, uh, what is our criteria for people working here and uh, broadening those criteria? Because I think the idea is also that you're depriving the students of their right of education if there isn't the environment. And I've also known of students who have to leave the school because because of some discriminatory reason there's such massive uh, conflict with a teacher that they end up leaving where I'm like wow okay we cannot wait for years for the people or the system to change because people effectively then cannot study mm -hmm. um, in the school and so it's interesting so now we've we've talked about individual people because they can be so powerful in uh, in 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 um, in blocking change for the entire school or also now, of course, for encouraging change if they have that power. But uh, I would also like to talk about uh, standards when we're talking about um, making diversity and anti-discrimination sustainable, then it should not be dependent on one person. It should not be the one dependent on one person in a negative sense, but also not in a positive sense that you started this job and then in five years you switch to something even better, hopefully, and then everything is leaving with you. So we have to establish these um, standards. And also what I've seen is in, when standards are established, people don't discuss them as much. You don't bring them into the discussion. There's just a standard and then people follow it, like the schools having, all of them having Gleichstellungsbeauftragte. This is actually a standard that has been established by law. Now having Antidiskriminierungsbeauftragte is becoming a bit of a standard and then you don't have to come into the school and be like, oh, it would be good if we had that. Everybody, it's like, it's like teenage peer pressure. Everybody else is doing it and okay, we're also going to do it. And I'm wondering like, How can we uh, push those standards and establish new standards and maybe also on a collaborative uh, level? Can I, yeah, just one little example, because I think the, the question of curriculum is important here. And uh, I think what one should avoid is saying diversity is a subject on its own, uh, given uh, because then it'll be this battleground where some will say this is really important and some will say it's not important and then you can not do anything except uh, discuss with each other. Uh, one course we have at the school is uh, devised by the, the, the photography uh, department where uh, what used to be a, a purely technical course on uh, lighting, lighting of faces now is called uh, lighting and representation. So the course where they 
learn, I'm not really sure, I mean, all kinds of things about shading and f-stops and so on, uh, just includes a variety of faces and, and therefore real-life problems. I mean, I was told that there was a road movie made with a, a black main character and a white main character driving in a car where they hadn't thought beforehand of the lighting issue, they ended up with a black guy having to put his uh, face out the window uh, because there were two f-stops different. And of course, the whole film was devised over the, the white main character's face. Uh, this is, of course, an extreme example. But the idea that this comes into the, the, the main fabric of what we're teaching and not an extra subject that you can discuss whether it's relevant or not. I think that that is, if we can achieve that on a on a wider scale, uh, and it's very obvious to me when I talk to the photography students, that they have a very different, I mean, it's a more ingrained, more question of how they actually do things and not an opinion uh, thing when they talk uh, diversity. So it, uh, but how you do that on a bigger scale, because we're still dependent on single professors, and I think they should have a lot of room to do uh, what they, how they want to teach. So it's a long, long-term uh, change. Yeah, maybe I can ask, since you are the head of education, uh, so the idea would be to not make diversity uh, a separate issue, but to just have it be a criteria of good filmmaking, for example, or good lighting or whatever. It's not a separate thing, it's just like... Things have to be visible and have to be, you know, like whatever basic criteria you would have for success in that area to to have diversity be part of that. And now you have this one course that you described. If you want to make this a standard for your school, like where would, what way would you have to do that? Or where would that have to happen to, to really make it a standard? Um, yeah, because I, I do believe in a lot of... Uh, I, I would not make I, I could but i wouldn't do a top-down approach saying now all the rest of you have to copy this i i believe very much in the ingenuity of this one teacher she has a philippine background and what actually happened on that course sorry i'm adding an extra detail is that our students are generally completely uninterested in film history uh to be honest uh i know other schools teach it for a year i mean our students uh when we tried that, they blocked the school and the head of the school was fired. So it has real life consequences. In this particular course, they got interested in film history. They wanted to understand, can that really be true? They actually watched a lot of uh, way older films than they would ever have done. But so my answer to this, I'm new to the school, but is that the research possibility we have, uh, and this is artistic research, not academic research, I will now uh, give a grant to this one teacher and through research it can be built into other places maybe but I want people to do it out of their own will and their own experimentation because this made sense lighting and uh, representation it may not make sense in a, in a similar way in editing I don't know I, I don't think I should be the judge of that but okay so one a uh, way to pinpoint that would be research funding. Yeah. Uh, again, a question of criteria. So if you want funding for research to include something like that in the criteria, for example. Yeah. I'm, I'm pushing for the standard. I'm going to find it. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we need a, a, a broader knowledge base at film schools. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we, we are a crafts and art school. And uh, at least in Denmark, the, there's a very strong anti-academic uh, urge and I think we should be very different from academia mm -hmm. but we do need to base on on some certain types of knowledge and and that and and we have to strengthen that um, in yeah but I, I think also even if we have standards and I mean we are developing also our own standards now at the European Film Academy we did uh, I feel even in the industry uh, the unconscious or even conscious bias, I would even frame it that way, still exists because um, if we look also this year, the European film on our selection, we have very strong films um, on topics like queer representation, uh, gender identity, transgender, 
um, but also refugees. But it's also f mostly from the white gays, and it's mostly an established filmmaker. From uh, and um, and still, like if you look also on the festivals, I mean they award this because they find it courageous, right? So um, still, and they maybe also follow certain standards of representation, even if they maybe in their institutions also who ask for standards, please give in a questionnaire already a checklist um, what, how is your film kind of diverse. And certain films tick the box. I mean, it's and they're also very strong films this year. But I feel still the gaze and the uh, uh, storytelling is very much not, uh, it's very conventional in a way. And it's still like a firm again, actually then uh, the key decision makers, oh yeah, okay, this filmmaker went for this very kind of courageous story. We applaud this person, which is also nice and it's political. And I mean, I also um, think this year we have very strong films in that, but still, it's still like going again in the same kind of narrative. So I feel even if we have the standards, we have to establish something where a narrative change has to be kind of standardized in a, different way i don't know still what but also to see that these stories are told in a very unconventional way and maybe also in a way where actually then really uh black filmmakers or uh queer filmmakers even have really their stories told and not again a cisgender white male person for example Yeah, maybe we can introduce a term real quick. You mentioned the white gaze, and I think this idea of the gaze is uh, so relevant to storytelling and filmmaking, which would mean that uh, even if I, as a Muslim uh, woman, would make a film about one of something, my, my experience or from my perspective or something, or uh, that in for me, because I've only, in stories, I've only seen myself a Muslim character in a way that it is told to non-Muslim white people. And so that would be the white gaze, me making a movie, but having a white person in mind as my audience. So I'm taking a detour. It's my story, but I'm not telling it from here. I'm first bringing it here through an uh, imaginary white perspective. And then and we have this for a lot of things, also the male gaze. Mm -hmm. Uh, to to uh, normative to heteronormative perspective and uh, something like that, so there are some standards in a way that we're really not uh, that aware of yet and that affect all of us. I think those standards need to be embedded rather than be separate, as you were saying. You know, it, they need to. I think particularly around queer content or people who are marginalized, it has to be traumatic. And that's the only way it will get commissioned or get funded. And, you know, as much as that has kind of had its course, you know, I was talking earlier about stereotyping in terms of kind of going, that's got us to this point. Now we need to get to the point of kind of going, actually, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't have to be traumatic in order for it to be impactful. You know, people who are under resident live their day-to-day -day lives just like everybody else. And they have joys and they have sadnesses. And... We should be saying, uh, like, should we be doing that? You know, there's very few pieces of content where I've seen, particularly from an LGBT perspective, where it's not based around trauma. You know, it's like, It's a Sin in the UK was huge and it was a fantastic piece of content, but it was purely trauma-based, you know, and actually a lot of my queer friends and LGBT friends were like, I don't want to watch it. I've seen so much of this. Yes, it's fantastic, but... <sighs> It's the same thing over again. I think the only thing that's really had quite a lot of impact in terms of queer joy has been Schitt's Creek and actually had a really lovely, happy ending. And it just shows that it doesn't have to be disastrous in order for it to have an impact. Yeah, so it's a lack of diversity in stories. We actually discussed this uh, yesterday a little bit where, I mean, we, we talked, I think we, we ex our discussion showed a bit the need for standards to not have it be up to an individual person and interpretation and so on. But Fatih already alluded to it that it doesn't stop. Of course, it doesn't solve it. We will still need to apply critical thinking and effort, uh, all of us. But so one effect is like where it's reduced to representation and it's just, for example, about having LGBTQA uh, stories, but there's no diversity within those stories. It's showing the same perspective over and over again. And it is uh, oftentimes a perspective that confirms this mainstream 
gays view and so on and is like oh i know coming out is dramatic or whatever i have the I, <laughs> this is this is what i know and so i uh, this idea that it has to apply Uh, to that and so it really makes me think that um, we've been talking about numbers but in a different way that diversity is a numbers game where there is no representation because of course we as individual groups are also so diverse within each other so that uh, the goal is to ha give a lot of people access to filmmaking and storytelling so that we will have a lot of stories Yeah, I agree entirely. I think there's a question of critical mass. I used to be a commissioning editor, but and can you imagine sitting, uh, if you're at a broadcaster, regional broadcast in Germany, you're doing one series on refugees. Will you not be almost obliged to make it a problem series? Because otherwise, you'll say you're not taking uh, refugees seriously. They have real problems if you make a sitcom Uh, you, so I think the moment you say, okay, we have five series that have refugees in them, maybe not as main care, then you, it will automatically happen. I, I, I don't think it, I don't think there's a mental blockade with, with people as such, but there's just a certain pressure to do certain things if the numbers are so small, uh, that, that you, there's no choice basically. And I think our goal isn't to make diversity initiatives that are better and better. Our goal is exactly this too. It is actually, it is actually about access uh, and yeah, and actually achieving this uh, this result where you have so many uh, people that the different realities can can exist and yeah, so. And can I ask, since we're here together, which is great, <laughs> about collaboration, uh, that your organization uh, supports collaboration, but also on this on this issue of standards, best practice, and so on, that uh, the schools can profit from one another, that they can learn from one another, from their own uh, best and worst uh, case examples, but from also maybe pushing those standards together and having this, uh, and maybe possibly creating peer pressure of like, oh, all the others actually <laughs> are including diversity as a criteria in uh, research funding or something. We're looking bad if we don't do it, or now we understand why we should do it. Yeah, I think uh, collaboration is very important, especially also just presenting um, uh, uh, best practices, uh, not only from film schools, but also, I think, from uh, funding institutions as well. I mean, there are also funds which, are, for example, in Belgium, as I aware of, they have a diversity coach when the script is already uh, uh, submitted, that uh, they can basically rely on a diversity coach reading the script if it's basically uh, also when, with, with the language, if it's inclusive or not. And um, and also other uh, funds um, do that too. But I think also, um, I hope we will also open the question later to the audience. Uh, it would be just nice also to hear from uh, the attendants here that various different challenges, but also maybe also uh, best practices at certain schools or initiatives which they kind of open to get also especially I think in the beginning we talked and the example what Jakob presented is um, that the film schools are really lacking still of people who are basically coming from social economic uh, marginalized families because in their kind of culture uh, working in the arts is very, very utopic uh, because, I mean, I'm coming also from a similar background where basically engineer, doctor, lawyer, and that's it. Oh, information science, that's now the new thing. So that brings all money. Uh, I mean, I convinced my parents hardly still today um, that I went for the social sciences and they still don't understand uh, what I did. I think one uh, just anecdote was that I actually invited once my parents to a lecture of mine, a seminar, and I basically, and they were just my guests. And then my mom came afterward and said, okay, now I understand what you're doing. So, and I think this is also something with film uh, and with the arts, which I think we have to 
kind of embed to the families already or to the students uh, even before applying uh, to make it also kind of welcoming to them, but also basically to say it makes also sense if you can tell your stories. But then again, we need also best practices in that, that these stories are already kind of represented in the, in the film on the, uh, on the screen, because if they don't basically see um, and Actually, um, the U.S. does it very well with uh, mainstream commercial uh, uh, franchises where they basically take now and have basically examples of black superhero heroes or black mermaid. And then, you know, and then and people are really identifying with that. And I think we have to find a middle ground how to also have these stories kind of told in order to motivate people. Yeah, I think you gave us a good keyword. Thank you so much, you guys, so far for uh, sharing all your uh, trial and error <laughs> stories. And I would like to open the question, but also the input uh, to the audience. I'm sure I can, I can also go around with the mic if you put your hand up. You can also take a second to think about it. Are there any questions or anything you would like um, Yeah, maybe to share? With the panel, with the room. Favorite bit. So uncomfortable. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not even. Un yeah, maybe that. But I'm not even uncomfortable to be honest. I think it's fine. I know. I know what's also to be sitting in the audience. I'm like, take a second. If not, I got more questions. Zero pressure. <laughs> I mean, whilst they think, just to what Fatih was saying, I, I don't mm. edit like editorial um, storytelling is what I'm known for in kind of my industries, and you know, I, I had to pull a student's film once before it even got shot because it was so absurd to me and you know my job as an editorial editorial advisor particularly in tv was to question everything why is this happening what have you done what research have you done and i had an east asian student who was trying to tell a muslim story which fundamentally is not an issue i just want to make that very clear it's not but the process and how you're bringing that narrative or that story is very important of going, what research have you done? Who have you included to understand these things? You know, why are you telling this story? Because you have your own stories to tell or you have other perspectives that you might feel more uh, comfortable identifying. And I realized, sadly for the student, it, he just wanted to make something really, um, how do I be say this politely, um, cliche and kind of impactful because he thought, oh, it's extremely dramatic. They only have two and a half minutes, but it was a Muslim woman being beaten by her Muslim husband. And I said to him going, why? He's like, oh, I think it's a really important story to be told. And I go, well, what's your experience with it? What do you know about it? Have you spoken to anyone? And he, he couldn't comfortably answer it. And so as a person who was in a position of power, I said, no, you know, rather than allowing that to be filmed because I think we have to make these kind of choices and decisions. And I then worked with the student to find out another way to do it, but that took a lot of hands-to-hand -hand kind of work with them. But we need to be able to kind of go, why? And what's your thought process and what's your research? And I think people are scared to do that. Yeah, again, uh, again, a quality issue, like what are our criteria for quality and also of these, this often quoted by uh, the Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, the danger of a single yeah. uh, story where it's like, yes, this is actually an important uh, story to tell. But I've had this also in my life because I also uh, teach on anti-Muslim racism and where people are like, yeah, but I want to help Muslim women. I'm like, yes, but it's like a certain number of Muslim women who are affected by issues like this but it's like almost 100% of us who are affected by anti-Muslim racism. Mm -hmm. So why don't we have more stories yeah. on that? Like, So that's what I meant earlier. Oftentimes it's narratives that kind of confirm in a way uh, or affirm this, uh, this established um, narrative. Have you guys thought about it? <laughs> huh? Yeah? Thank you really for inspiring us already. For us, it's really informative and we learn a lot. And one thing that, that struck me very much was Jakob's film that you presented, being part of series. Now, if we're talking about collaboration and cooperation, I also thought about how much you're doing at European Film Academy in terms of the audiovisual uh, sphere, evermore. 
uh, in our perception. So I wondered if, if, for example, connecting the audiovisual dots, because I'm sure at London Film School there exists something like that, and to make a retrospective of these small films, of these small success stories, but put them really, while it's only a local principle, put them on the European scale could be something that could be very interesting, because of course we're talking about excess and we're discussing a lot about excess. So w while not just taking in the experience of one country or one school especially, maybe there could be a retrospective and suddenly we would see a lot of that. Are you planning something in that sense of bringing like local success stories to the more European framework? Yeah, I think it's, um, well, I'm planning actually for next year to have for sure digital events for our members. Of, I mean, we have now 4,800 um, so far, um, which is kind of a lot, but still we need more. 4,800? Uh, 4,800 4, members. But pan European. It's, it's, it sounded, uh, I sounded a lot. I just wanted to confirm. Yes, it sounds a lot, but if we look, uh, if we see the uh, geographical diversity we have because we represent also uh, countries like uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan and also Israel and Palestine as well. So uh, um, uh, it's still like few, especially if we compare to the academic uh, American Academy, right? So, um, but still um, I think um, what we want to do is a culmination or kind of, of best practices or represent uh, representations but also uh, especially, um, um, I think when we talk about diversity inclusion, there's always mostly the angle lately, and I think it has something to do with Black Lives Matter as well. It's mostly on race and ethnicity, and it's coming from the US and also from the UK, more to continental Europe. But I feel especially we have to also look on other representations and uh, that's why I really want to do also kind of um, uh, uh, yeah uh, like let's say an overview of these different uh, diversities which we have and we are now opening also in our board a seat for transnational ethnic linguistic communities mostly the Sami people but also Roma so we have also this aspect of indigenous um, which also exist in Europe, right? But <laughs> mostly it's associated to the US uh, or Canada. So, um, and which is also, I think, important, but then also to, when it comes to queer uh, uh, stories, queer representations as well. So I think in that sense, we want also more dissect or kind of deconstruct in a way diverse inclusion. And not only because I feel like the people are just overwhelmed with when we talk about diverse inclusion as a broad and I think if we have basically what you mentioned Christoph basically like um, also um, more examples of different success stories or even like um, I mean if we are talk with um, and obviously this, these success stories would be then benefit for us if those success stories at one and also we will be a part of our membership. So we would then have also a more diverse membership in order to basically have a diverse board and then also have diverse films represented uh, represent on the European scale. Hi. So um, there is a Monaco-based non-governmental organization called IEFTA. It's uh, International Emerging Film Talent Association. And they actually, what they do, they bring um, talents. And uh, so they um, empower um, filmmakers and to bring them to festivals. Um, and uh, they work a lot with refugees. And you were just mentioning uh, refugees. But did you come up with um, also project initiatives at your at your schools? Uh, we are mentioning elite school. I saw see a little bit controversial uh, controversial because elite means like um, mostly um, so you certain groups. So maybe we have to be very careful with the terms we are choosing. Um, so but I would like to know in general if you come up with uh, some initiatives for the refugees. Um, from ours, I, 
uh, we deal mainly with talent development and not uh, final films, obviously. Uh, I can I don't think we have a specific. Uh, obviously, we have students who have refugee background, uh, but we don't have a specific initiative. Something we are working on is. Uh, because we often overlook uh, what Patty is saying, the, 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 the minorities just around the corner. And in Denmark's case, it's uh, Greenland and the Faroe Islands, which are, I mean, it, they are part of the Danish realm, but they have actually not been able to uh, get support from the Danish Film Institute. A very curious or uh, absurd situation. Can I ask, is this a colonial situation? Yes, it's a very colonial situation that is by most Danes not acknowledged as a colonial situation. Uh, we we see it as we were the benefactors. There's an issue of who came first to Greenland, or maybe the Vikings came before them, and so on. So we don't really... I mean, we had slaves in the West Indies, and we know that that's a colonial situation. With Greenland, it's a very tricky issue. Uh, so we have been part of that also uh, we're doing an initiative on on that because that is focused on on acknowledging talent from these two uh, countries and actually the there's a revolution in happening now in the uh, Faroe Island uh, film production there have been major series shot there and and so on but it's taken taking a long time but it's interesting how and we know that for I mean if you make a film that's from the Faroe Islands it will get into festivals, even if it's a fairly shitty film, uh, because it's the first, more or less, from the Faroe Islands. So there's uh, an added attraction. Then when you're on your 10th or 20th film, you have to deliver in terms of quality. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, uh, but you were also talking a bit about initiatives and how they have a, a tendency to, to uh, disappear after a while that you can do something and then yeah know. i'm i'm quite um i'm quite anti initiatives i've seen them i've run many myself so i will put my hands up to it um i've i've seen how destructive and how performative they can be i think i think initiatives in the concept of it is a great idea but there's no through I'm sorry, thought. Can, can you just yeah. tell me what, what do you mean when you say initiative? So I think if we're trying to get um, funding for marginalized group to make content or trying to get more people of color or queer people in, um, mm -hmm. whether also if there's a gender imbalance going, we're actually only going to fund X amount to female filmmakers, you know, and then we don't really look at the intersectionality of that as well, going, you know, are they black female makers? Are they queer female makers? Are they um, disabled? But from my experience, and maybe this is a particularly UK thing, and please forgive me if I'm wrong here, is that it's great. Here's the money. Go do it. Okay, bye. And that's kind of what happens. And they, there's no kind of going, okay, well, how do we develop you further? What projects are we going to bring you on to next? What's the kind of storyline or narrative that you can kind of help embed within our... For me at the time, it was I was working at Broadcasters, and it it was very tokenistic, you know, and that's the honesty of it. And... That's why I can be quite anti-initiatives because I don't think they have the through thought that they need to have. There's no, you know, I've I've got a lot of, particularly when I run, I used to be ahead of the Black Network uh, because also no one from our kind of staffing who was Black wanted to run it. So I, I ended up doing it. So I created initiatives to create Black filmmakers uh, and we got funding for it. We ring-fenced it. All of them got to make great products and make great content. And then they were just lost after that because it was the only thing that they got. And particularly those from who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, they don't have the funding or the finance to continue that project on or to do more. Whereas I think that's why I think it can be, I call it the illusion technique. So look how great we are. Look what we're doing. We're doing such a good job. We're definitely getting representation. But actually the systemic structure is still the same. They're still not getting access. They're still not getting opportunity. You know, if that was the case, I've been part of, several initiatives over the last 10 years and diversity shouldn't be this deep of a conversation still if they were doing the job that they were meant to be doing uh so i'm i'm always a bit like as soon as i hear the term initiative my back goes up and i'm a bit like Ugh. so is this maybe also a resource thing because uh, initiative is limited right so it's limited time and project funds allocated and stuff and so usually film schools i don't know about excellent film schools 
But <laughs> <laughs> you really taking on that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just joking. Uh, no, I'm just saying. But usually schools, they're like, oh, we're low on funds. We're not like major corporation or something. We're low. We have limited funds, and so like, oh, we want to do something, but we have limited funds, and so we do something limited, like an initiative. And of course, the alternative would be like to. Uh, do a massive change on structure, but then that would be much more. And, and it's to the point that you were, we, I think we spoke about it earlier, yeah. is kind of going, who's given that perspective and narrative? Because if it's not being done in a certain way, it's not being seen as good enough. So rather than empowering our filmmakers to kind of go, tell us what you want and we'll help create that, particularly when I've worked for major broadcasters, they've worked with minority groups, but they're kind of going, but we still want it to feed to our major audiences. So they're not really telling the stories that they want to do. They're telling a a watered down version so that it's more um, palatable. And I always find that really interesting because I'm going, why, if we are going to do trauma, let's do trauma. Let's do it, like, let's go gung-ho. Let's go absolutely to the wall. Um, but they're kind of going, no, it's too much. Our audiences can't take it. And I'm going, well, that's their experience. That's that's what they're trying to bring across. We should be telling them to do that. Yeah. But it's it's being... Monitored, I think is probably the best way to do it. I'm just no. trying to, sorry, uh, I'm just one question. I'm trying to understand, like, from this funding perspective, what is the alternative to initiatives? Um, for me, it's strategic through lines. So, okay, if we're going to say we want, let's say, some black filmmakers, great. What tools, what kind of accessibility, what resources are we giving to them? And what does that look like in five years' time? not just the five months that they're going to be on this initiative. Because, you know, are we giving them access to directors? Are we putting them on our books? You know, and kind of going, oh, I've got this great, fine, it's a pilot TV show that's coming up, but we'd love to come you as a director or the producer on it, so that they're getting that experience. But when they're going, they've, got, they've done the great initiative, they've created a great, okay, let's say great, in very quotation marks, films or, or content, and then they'll go and get a job and they're like, sorry, you're not experienced enough. We don't want we don't want you here. Or actually we need more. And then they don't have that funding to do that. That needs to be a, a lot more strategically thought out about kind of going, if I want to do an initiative now, I have to have a three-year plan. So the first six months you're learning, you're educating yourself, you're getting the skills. The second six months you're getting onto a project, you're learning all those experience, hands-on experience. You're learning how to deal with different people because let's face it, it's dealing with different people. That's the really hard part in a production. It's not necessarily the skills that they bring. And then kind of going, okay, well, there's your, here's your one-year project. And then on the third year, we're going to have this pilot that we're going to do. You're going to take the lead on that. You'll get the support. But there's, there's a lot more thought that's put into it. There's a lot more support that's put into it. So... But it's a limited strategy. And that's that's my point. It's kind of going, I think for me, initiatives are a maximum, and this is me being extremely graceful, is a year. And that's I, and most initiatives that I've seen have been three months or six months. And then they've kind of been going, well, good luck. I, I kind of, I don't, I think that's a great opportunity for them. And actually a lot of those individuals do look at it as a great opportunity because they're getting to do something that they've never been able to do before. But then that's why we also have a, a massive issue with retention in the industry. More and more people of color are leaving the industry because they're not getting the access. More and more queer people are not being able to tell their stories because it's not traumatic enough. You know, more and more women are being told that they need to do things in a certain way. So it's, you know, and that, that's what I mean. I don't disagree with what you're saying. I just think that there needs to be a lot more thought and um, funding and research and things to put in it to make sure that there's longevity in it. And I think we don't currently, we don't have that in the UK, definitely. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, and I've worked with MIPCOM too, and I know exactly what they're like, um, but it's, I don't disagree. I just don't necessarily like it, if I'm being honest. But I think there could be a lot more, a lot more that could be done in order to make sure that they're not moments. And that's my issue. Initiatives are moments. They need to be every single day on ongoing. And yeah. the question is also there, I mean, what stories from Africa are basically then represented from the streamers? I mean, um, again, um, I think uh, I understand your frustration with initiatives and I'm really agreeing also that it's mostly very much tokenistic. I feel there should be some rooms or networking like where you meet with key decision makers already from the beginning of a process, even if it's meets the festivals or what you have, um, just that programmers 
know about you uh, already before, you know, what you, what's your aesthetic and so on and uh, in general. But I feel also then, uh, even if it's tokenistic, uh, also the communities are very hard to reach because there's a lot of frustration. I mean, there's a lot of frustration applying to film schools. I have a lot of friends. I encounter a lot of people from marginalized positions in the last one and a half years um, in this industry, they are not applying to any gatekeeping kind of initiatives because they know that they are not, or that's their assumption, that they don't get accepted. So there is a kind of, it's like an electoral, if you don't, if you're frustrated with the politics, you don't go for votings anymore. So for elections, and, and it's the same like this. They try still to survive in this, um, maybe to do it also very in a very unconventional, intersectional way, maybe to still bring their stories to life, but it's very hard and they know it as well. So we have to find also a, a tool to reach these people to basically make them not anymore frustrated enough from these initiatives because still they see that certain stories are just supported and funded. As you mentioned, it's trauma, it's a certain narrative, and um, some narratives work, I mean, uh, and some narratives also do it, even if it's conventional, it's still like, oh, yeah, it's working, it's good, uh, and uh, we see it also uh, in the film landscape now, but still I think that it's a step-by-step step and it's a slow process, so we have to kind of um, um, not momentous, mom momentize, but maybe basically really kind of put it again more to the standardization that it's basically relevant today. I think we all agree that uh, change is happening. If you look at our panel, Fatih, me and D were all three people who were hired Uh, specifically to uh, to uh, to work on these issues of diversity and inclusion, and we're being paid for it, so there's funding. My position is limited, so I'm a bit of an initiative, but who knows <laughs> that might Sorry. that might, that might change. It's the same for let's, me. Let's I stop mean... hating on the initiatives. <laughs> Some initiatives are trying their best, okay. <laughs> um, But yeah, but I mean, this is what we're trying to look at today in our talk, not only about change happening, but how we can really make that uh, change impactful and also sustainable. So that uh, that is the key word sustainable, I think, also around the initiatives that after an initiative ends or a, uh, or a, a, um, a member of staff leaves whether they're working with diversity or it's just a person power that we know that these uh, changes will will keep going and yeah and 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 give more access and create more stories so at this point i would like you guys all for being here and sharing for us thank you guys all here for being here and uh, sharing your time with us i hope everybody in the room leaves with something helpful And yeah, see you see you around soon hopefully. Thank you too. Thank you. Thank you.